the, it rolled back the wheels for weeks on this. I, I would say it was uh, very clever on behalf of the killers or the mastermind behind the killers. Who is, in your mind, after studying all this, who are the primary suspects right now? Number one for me is the sun. Welcome to the global phenomenon, surviving the survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. So, uh, Carm, it doesn't happen often, but uh, it is uh, mid-November and there is a hurricane coming through. And I've never seen drearier weather in my life, which has taken me back to uh, Jersey, New York days. How did you raise me in a place where it rained every other day and was uh, an average temperature of, I don't know, 33 degrees in the winter? Why, why would you do that to me? It had nothing to do with the weather. It had to do with you being a difficult child. Today, because it is uh, pouring um, and is just horrendous out. So, And anyway. what's the worst in, in Miami, that the sk- he has three small kids and they have no school. That's definitely the worst part about it. And my wife is home. It's a it's a perfect storm, as they say. All three kids, the wife, they're all home. But listen, we're in for a treat today in a odd way because we have probably one of the best reporters on the story we're about to talk to. We're not in for a treat in the sense that this was a brutal murder we're about to talk about. So, Carm, we, as you well know, have been discussing the Dan Markell murder for close to a year on this podcast, but there is an other high profile, very high profile case out of Toronto, Canada involving Jews. Are we, I guess we're starting to corner the market on Jewish true crime, but we're going to get into no, this because case. We already got the bad name. Do you want to help my son? His company, Content Partners Media, specializes in brand video and content creation for innovative companies and others. Please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com and hire him. I repeat, please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com. This is the Sherman murders, and there's no one who really knows more about this than the person joining us now, Brad Hunter of the Toronto Sun. Brad, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, Joel. Carm, how are you guys today? Great, great. And so uh, you said nice it's meeting you. You said it's sunny and warm in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, well, warmish. You know, it's all relative. By warm, he means uh, 15 degrees, degrees Fahrenheit. Can't yeah, go skating so, today. Yeah, you can't, you can't go skating today. So. Uh, Let me tell the audience about Brad real quick. Brad Hunter is the national crime columnist for the Toronto Sun. That is a serious beat he's got there. Previously, he worked for the same company I did when I was at Fox News Channel. He worked for the New York Post, and and his work has been published in newspapers and magazines around the globe. He's also the author, at last count, of, I think, one book, Cold-Blooded Killers. Is it more than one book? Two books. What's So Cold-Blooded Killers, and what's the other one? Uh, the most recent one is uh, Inside the Mind of John Wayne Gacy, the Killer Clown. Carm, do you know about John Wayne Gacy? He dressed as a clown when he killed people. No. Carm, by the way— I uh, am a Johnny come lately to crime. Brad, just so you know— <laughs> Well, welcome aboard. <laughs> Carm is a uh, also a licensed therapist, not just a Holocaust survivor, so she can analyze some of these sickos. But anyway, Brad lives in Hamilton, Ontario. He enjoys, as we all do, pubs, ice hockey. Carm, who's your favorite ice hockey team? Stop it. Let's move on here. If you want to get on to our uh, email distribution list, which we know you do, you just drop your email in the comment section in YouTube. Please follow us on Patreon, on Instagram, on Facebook. And now let's get to the uh, crime at hand here that we're discussing. And that, of course, is Barry and Honey Sherman, the Sherman murders. Barry Sherman was a Canadian businessman and philanthropist. He was chairman and CEO of a company called Apotex, founded by the Winter family, which will be sort of important. We'll get back to that in a little while. Uh, He had an estimated net worth of somewhere about $3.2 billion, just a little north of mine at the time of his death. That is all according to Forbes. He was the 12th wealthiest man in Canada. What's interesting about this case, which we'll talk about with Brad, this December, I think December 15th, I think they were murdered on the 13th, discovered on the 15th, but this December 
will mark the fifth anniversary of the murders of this generic pharmaceutical titan and his wife. They were killed in the suburban Toronto home on the evening, as I said, Wednesday, December 13th. Their bodies were posed in macabre positions found, as I just said as well, 36 hours later. They were hanged from belts above the basement swimming pool. Uh, Originally, Toronto police considered the deaths a murder-suicide. One of Brad's colleagues, who's been really all over this case, uh, Kevin Donovan at the Toronto Sun, got some paperwork and filed court documents and found out that, you know, this murder-suicide was obviously seen as uh, the cause of death, uh, and that was a working theory for like six weeks. He, he's also gathered a lot more information, as I'm sure. Brad, bottom line, this December 15th, five years, no arrests, what's going on? Well, five years on, the cops say here that they have a working theory. I had lunch with a couple detectives just before we got on here, and uh, one is leaning in one direction. They have no connection with the Sherman case. One's leaning one way, the other thinks it, it will never be solved. When you say one, see, it's interesting. You just came from a lunch. You're a real journalist. Unlike myself, I was a TV journalist, but print guys actually go to lunch with sources and get real information like you see in the movies. So you said one doesn't think this case will ever be solved. That's a little depressing. But the other one leans the other way. Does that mean a theory as to who may have committed this crime or he just thinks it will be solved? Well, he wouldn't tip his hand. But I mean, I think, you know, without getting myself in any uh, trouble or anything like that, I think, you know, the case is all about money and it gets down to sort of a quay bono. Who did it benefit? Who did Barry Sherman, and there's no doubt. I mean, suggestions that Honey may have been the real target are are simply a red herring. It was it was Barry. So who is going to benefit from the death of Barry Sherman? Number one, pharmaceutical giants because he had you know eaten their lunch on generic drugs for decades. Uh, number two, it could be there were rumors of a $150 million condo deal that he'd fronted the cash. The thing collapsed and he wasn't getting it back. You know, there were reports that there were Iranian individuals involved in that. And then you get to uh, his family. You know, he had inherited a drug company from his uncle who died tragically and suddenly and then within 17 days of his wife leaving four orphan children. Now, the deal on that was Empire uh, Empire Laboratories, where they were the largest uh, uh, drug manufacturers in Canada. I mean, among the deals in the will was that the four winter children would have jobs with Empire uh, as long as the company wasn't sold. So he thought that that was fine and that they would get 5%. The deal would only be voided if the company was sold. Well, in 1972, Barry sells the company. That completely voids the deal. So there's that aspect. And we'll hear about one of the Winter sons in a few minutes named Kerry Winter and why he's a, a factor in all this. I just wanted to take a half step back here because I it went right over my head. Did you say Iranian, like Iranian? There was some kind of. Yeah. What, what is that all about? Because I had never heard that. Well, yeah, though that's uh, that they had uh, uh, people from that area of the world had come Because Barry and Honey's uh, North Toronto mansion was up for sale because they planned to move into a new 16,000 square foot home that they were building. And these were unidentified people that came in, vanished, and, you know, had a look around the house and vanished. In addition, you know, there were Iranian backers of a, a Toronto condo project and they were into Barry uh, Sherman for $150 million. The fourth is his own family. His son Jonathan was into him for tens of millions of dollars. So, you know, it was like uh, the landlord, the slumlord in New York who got murdered. And the headline in the post was who didn't hate him. Well, Brad, so uh, this is the two things. This is why I'm leaving my children $10 and not tens of millions of dollars. But before we get going on some of the details of the case, you just sort of mentioned this slumlord in New York, but as it pertains to Barry Sherman, what was his reputation? What kind of person? Because I understand he was quite litigious, but as a human being, what did most people think of this guy? May he rest in peace. Well, I mean, there's the, there's the, uh, I mean, there's the official version, you know, 
charitable, philanthropic, and that sort of stuff. Another person who had done business with him just re referred to him as the most despicable human being he'd ever met with absolutely zero redeeming features. So, you know, mm -hmm. take, your, take your pick. Who described him that way, the latter description? Uh, Dr. Morton Shulman, a, uh, a well-known uh, figure uh, here in Toronto uh, who had some business dealings with Barry Sherman. And he's been ruled out, I assume, Mr. Shulman? Yeah, he's Shulman been or... ruled out. He has been <laughs> ruled out. Okay, so let's get back to the, to the discovery. I believe it's a real estate agent. Her name is Elise Stern. As you said, they had their house up for sale. They're moving into a modest 16000 Square foot home, Carm, 16,000 square feet. It's more than you, you and need I roller need. roller skates. Yeah, so they're moving into the 16,000 square foot home. Elise Stern, nice Jewish woman, is showing the home and discovers the bodies. Brad, can you kind of relate to the audience how these bodies were found? The, the bodies were found, as you mentioned earlier, you know, posed in a macabre way, strangled and with handcuffs over in the, on a rail overlooking their pool. There wasn't a pin out of place in their house. The police, you know, initially, you know, fouled up miserable. A, they jumped the gun on declaring it a murder-suicide, when in fact it was a double homicide. That was part of the thing. The, the crime scene may have been contaminated. What happens is, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping a bit myself, but the family hires their own lawyers and detectives. Now, the detectives the family hires are former Toronto homicide detectives. You know, whether they've come up with anything more, I don't know a whole bunch, but they've kind of hovered over the investigation like vultures. You know, I know the Toronto police still have one detective on the case, but that way, I mean, the head of homicide told me he would tell me all about it the day he retires. The guys that you had lunch, the these are retired co detectives. You had homicide detectives. That no, you no, no, active, active. Oh, active. Homicide. And do they? Uh, I, I know these are obviously sources. You're not revealing names, but do they feel like the case has been bungled from the get go? Like a lot of people think. You know, that's acknowledged by a wide of, array of people, including police. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Bruce MacArthur uh, serial killing. Yeah, I wanted you. So there was a big serial killer at the time. What was going on with him? What was he up to? And how did that? Well, he, was, he was murdering, uh, essentially, you know, gay brown men who were heavily in the closet and dismembering them and a landscaper. And he would plant them in their body parts in planters of at people's homes. Brad just said, bottom line, it's about the money. Do you agree with that? Do you think it's money? Because you were, when no one was saying Harvey Adelson, you were saying Harvey Adelson. You had a hunch, and now he's on everyone's radar. So do you believe that this No, could no, the, the Markel case was interesting in the sense, and you are in, you are in this uh, investigative mode. Uh, the motivation is either money or passion, what are the prime motivators of, of, of uh, crimes? Oftentimes, they're uh, wrapped into one big happy bundle. Yes, yes. Well, well, the Markel case was a little different in the sense that it wasn't about money and it wasn't about a, a passion. It, it, it was about an overbearing Jewish mother. Exactly. So we saw some similarities when we were looking <laughs> at that case between this the Jewish mother and the, that Jewish mother, um, uh, what's her name, Donna Edelson. Donna Edelson. Uh, I always say it's all, almost the same family structure minus the crime so far. Well, this is interesting because so what are the chances you got these two very high-profile crimes? And again, Ruth Markell has her book out, The Unveiling, and there's a dateline coming out. And they're uh, both from Toronto. Correct. And they both have Toronto roots and Brad is covering both. But let's stick right now to the Sherman case and we'll get Brad's take on some of the Markel stuff uh, before he kicks us off. So everyone was kind of including your colleague and I don't know what your thoughts were, but but basically Kevin Donovan, shout out to him because he's done great reporting and you. But he, he was kind of beside himself and said, look, there's no way this is a murder suicide. And then I was thinking about it. So they were discovered hanged in an odd position. But isn't it possible that he killed uh, or strangled honey and then hanged himself i mean although very unlikely it is possible right or no well, it, 
would be within the realm of possibility. I'm, you know, altogether sure how happy their marriage was. I hope their lawyers aren't listening. I mean, uh, the family lawyers aren't listening, but I mean, you know, no one knows what goes on behind closed Closed doors. doors. He was, he was, he was retiring and focused he was workaholic focused only on business she was you know the bell of the of, of the phil- philanthropic ball you know and terror of hairdressers you know store clerks and uh, other such things but i mean i think i think the closer to home you get i think probably that might be the the closer you get to the killer that's just my opinion but, but it, it, it i am astonished I'm surprised and astonished that these um, billionaires, okay, there aren't that many walking around Toronto, and then the, A, they didn't find who murdered them, the police. B, now they assigned only one investigator, one investigator to the case. Carm, you teed me up for my question. All excellent points. It's a very high-profile couple, you know, arguably one of the top 12 most high-profile couples because the 12th richest family uh, in, in Canada. In all of Canada, not only Toronto. But now they say that there was this domino effect. As an example, video from a homeowner across the road was ignored. DNA and fingerprints were not collected in a timely fashion, which I think Brad alluded to earlier. The lead investigator on this case, Brad, apparently didn't even visit the scene of the crime personally for a few days, and then there was also a synagogue nearby there where there was a choir practicing, and they didn't interview anybody there. What is going on in Toronto, man? Well, what's going on in Toronto is that they made a uh, they made a change at the top of the homicide unit. You know, this is a shout out to Toronto police. Now, you know, irrespective of, of, of Sherman's, is that they have one of the highest clearance rates of of any North American city hovering around 85% clearance, which very, very, very few cities, police services can boast of it. I'm sorry. You said that Toronto has a what clearance? It was hard to tell. Uh, Clearing homicides, solving homicides. Solving, solving. So how long ago was that, that they changed the leadership? Well, probably, probably maybe six months to a year after both the whole MacArthur thing and that. That's that's when they changed it, and and uh, you know some people retired, and they the their clearance rate skyrocketed, you know through a lot of work with communities and things like that as well. But that's you know pretty spectacular in in 2022. So, uh, so Brad, what's your hunch? Do you think exactly this does? Exactly, I was going to ask you, and before we ask you the same thing, what is your hunch? Who is in your mind after studying all this? Who are the primary suspects right now? Number one for me is the son. Mm. Okay. Mm. We're going to get to him. We're going to get to him in a minute. We're going to get to him in a okay. minute. I'm teeing it up. But, I mean, is your hunch that do you believe it will get solved one day? I think it will. I think it will. Uh, it seems a long way in that way now, but I, I think it will out. You know, I mean, somebody... You know, in a lot of these cold cases, somebody needs a jet, uh, get out of jail free card. That's when it happens or somebody's conscience overwhelms them or they're no longer afraid or police find something that they didn't find on the first run through. So there's a you you mentioned this guy, not by name, but I will now. His name is Detective Constable. I love it because they're Brits. Once again, Detective Constable Dennis Yim. He is uh, apparently the lone detective working this case full time. Is that right? You'd think that they, maybe I'm naive, but I would think they would have more than one guy working this case full time. And if you, are you in touch with this guy? Um, not, so, not really so much. I, I, I talked to other people in the unit and part of that is I don't know how much he would, you know, whether it would be just a, a fool's errand to even call because, you know, it's that sensitive because not only was, you know, Barry Sherman uh, and his wife per, you know, deeply plugged into the establishment of Toronto. They were deeply plugged into the country's political establishment and particularly the governing Liberal Party right now. So uh, part of the Canadian nature that, you know, they, they want to believe that bad things and bad people are uh, south of the 49th parallel. <laughs> we know that that's not so. 
So apparently Toronto police are now, this is one of the more recent pieces of information, but Toronto police are now per- pursuing leads in five different countries they've announced. They won't say which ones. Is this uh, in fact happening? And also I should have led with this, silly me, but uh, what is the most recent news in this case? Is there something that's come out very recently? One of the prevailing theories has always been that the killers came in, did the work, got out of the country like that night. Police, is they didn't check the airport. Maybe, you know, needle in a haystack. Maybe that's your guy. But, you know, that's due diligence. That's stuff you have to do, you know, if you want to solve a homicide. And apparently they went to the Toronto airport eventually. But by that time, they had already de- deleted their their files, from what I understand. Is that right? Well, that's that's exactly right. Everything was done too slow. You know, it was like a clown car in action. Maybe all the dumb kids were on that particular night. I mean, that's the way it looks. You know, some of the things were very obvious and uh, that you have to do, and they didn't do them. And, you know, they may have let a killer escape in the interim. Yes, Carm. I, I, thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> Brad's calling on you. I love it. <laughs> Carm raises should, our hand for those who are listening but, and not watching. I, it's not clear to me. I love Brad, if by the, the way. If they were, I do too. Anytime. I do too. And if I, if I hired a killer, okay, I would say to them, kill them, the two of them, and then get to the airport. I wouldn't say do any fancy footwork like uh, hang hang them with belts and tie their arms and you know do all the other fancy footwork. It's almost somebody who did it himself and with a lot of anger. Brad, they do say that Donna Adelson and Karm have many similarities, and here she's telling you how she's going to carry but, out. But you know, listen, I am the type of a, I am the type of a person who watches romances. Uh, uh, rom-coms, to, uh, romantic rom-com, comedies. To relax, and I don't like violence, and I don't want to have bad dreams. So I really am not an expert, but I'm just thinking psychologically. If I, sure. uh, if I hired somebody to kill somebody... What's the question? The question is, would I add to it some fancy footwork and... And put the... The, the, the bodies the belt, in a weird position. weird position at the swimming pool. I would just go... Brad, does she bring up a good point if these were hired killers? She brings up a a very good point. And I'm, you know, I'm, as you know, I I don't have all the information on the thing. But what I would say, Carm, the killers, they wanted to put out red herrings. Because, as everybody knows, in a homicide investigation, you know, for lack of a better term, time is money. And so if... You've got the police chasing down this uh, the, with the idea, with the working theory that it's a murder-suicide. But he's out of the country. Evidence has been lost. Time that was of the essence is gone. So that's why I think they did it. I mean, if you just wanted to kill somebody, I agree. Go in, pop, pop, then get on the plane. But they, it rolled back the wheels for weeks on this. I would say it was uh, very clever on behalf of the killers or the mastermind behind the killers. Walking man. Um, a person with an unusual gait was walking in the vicinity of the Sherman's home around the time of their deaths. Uh, they called the man, police this is, a suspect and asked for the public's help in identifying him, but they waited four years almost to do that. Who is this guy who's become known as the walking man? Now, I did the story on that, and uh, I broke the story on that. Was that the walking man? Um, the, the walking man walks in a way that only someone with a prosthesis on their leg would. Police in Canada, they fear the media, they fear public scrutiny. So it's not like you phone the FBI and they give you the whole damned indictment. You know, it has to be squeezed out. You have to do a lot of your own door knocking and using your head to, to come to conclusions. But but yeah, they, they I, I, I'm pretty certain that they think the guy with the prosthesis is the killer. Well, it's mind blowing, though, because is that correct that it took them four years to get this video out that they had? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's incomprehensible to me, but we'll uh, we'll take it as it's been reported. So uh, this is kind of interesting. So uh, there's a woman named Mary, Mary Sheckman. That's Honey Sherman's sister. She came right. out, I don't know, not that long ago, maybe a year or so ago, and said that someone was making a quote-unquote statement killing. Uh, and she believed that the killings may have been motivated not by money, but by religion, saying that the Shermans were strong supporters of Israel. Honey was very vocal about being Jewish, said that there were a lot of people of a certain ethnicity going through the house at a certain time, and Honey would use phrases that were not politically correct. That did not make sense to me until you told me about the Iranians. So is that uh, that has to be who she's talking about there, right? Yeah, right? That's, that's who she's talking about, but I think her f- theory is utter nonsense. Uh, you know, it's about it's about money. It's so ridiculous to me that why would she even make this statement? What do you think was behind that? Was there anything behind it or just basic naivete? I think it could have been know. Jewish I mean, paranoia, her, you know? You know, as Bradley. far as I know, her and her... her and her husband were uh, somewhat on Barry and Honey's coattails. You know, they had the dough. And uh, so, you know, I do know that. I don't know, you know, I think her, I, I think her, I won't go into motivation or anything like that, but I think her uh, theory is nonsensical. So, th- so there's been plenty of friction, I think, between the police and the Sherman family. Now, in October 2018, the family announces uh, a tip line their own private tip line and a ten million dollar reward for it. Imagine if, if I if you were worth, thir- whatever four billion dollars and the reward's only ten million, they couldn't have paid more. <laughs> for them. It should be a hundred million dollars, and someone will come forward. You cheap bastards. Anyway, so in October 2018, they offer a ten million dollar reward. Uh, what I thought was interesting about this, Brad, is soon after that announcement from the family. So soon after that, this guy named uh, Mark Sanders, he was the chief of the TPS, the Toronto Police Service. He had his own press conference, and he said in that press conference, I have to be cognizant that the suspect or suspects are watching right now. I know that for a fact. That's a bold statement. So he was basically implying at this press conference, Brad, and correct me if I'm wrong, that he thought someone in the family was probably responsible for this. Is that correct? Yeah, that that seemed to be what he was getting at. And you, and remember, uh, as you know, as I, I said to Carm, her and I might go in and just pop the guy, right, or pop them. Mm-hmm. But red herring. You want to throw red herrings in there? What do you do? You set up a uh, ten million dollar reward and a tip line, and hire your own investigative team. You know, kind of like a bureaucrat in the in the way that the worst thing that could happen to them is if something's actually done. So. At the time of their death, uh, majority ownership of the company went to the Sherman children. It was Lauren, Jonathan, Alexandra, Kaylin. Kaylin is a woman, a daughter? Yeah. yeah. Lauren, Alexandra, Kaylin, I am married, but I could make exceptions for that kind of money if you're listening. <laughs> um, so Jonathan, 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 Jonathan. We asked Brad, and he said he pointed the finger right at Jonathan. So this is interesting. Two weeks before the murder, Carm, two weeks before the murder, there was a request from Barry Sherman that Jonathan and his business partner, a guy named Adam Paulin, pay back between 50 and $60 million that Barry had loaned them. His father, this is according to Jonathan, uh, he was in a difficult financial situation, but vowed to restart the flow of cash down the road. What was that all about, Brad? Well, I guess the long and short of it is, is that, you know, Jonathan has set up breweries and storage companies and that, that, that's, that's what it was. And none of them have been particularly successful, but when your dad's worth a few billion dollars, uh, you know, you can live and learn sort of thing. And uh, the, the impression I got, I could be completely wrong is that he's not, Jonathan's not a particularly good businessman. But, you know, further to to that is that, oh, less than a year after Barry and Honey Sherman had been murdered, Jonathan fired the longtime president, right hand, and probably closest friend of Barry Sherman, a guy named Jack Kay, who was president of Apotex. That kind of, uh, you know, took me a bit by surprise. He isn't 
saying anything, but he fired him. And then, of course, you know, earlier this year, he sold the company. So I don't know. Do you sell an extremely profitable com- company? Is it, is it a sensible decision to make? I'm sorry. You know, the, the timeline with firing the president, when did that happen in relation to the murder? I think that was uh, they were murdered in December 7th, December 2017. And Jack K was fired in September 2017. Wow. Or 2018. I, I so he was he was fired after the murder. A, mu- a year after, after the a year after the murder, and and that's because the children had took control of the company. The son had taken care of the company. I don't think I don't think the sisters give a wit for that as long as their trust funds keep rolling in. I think one's a yoga teacher and another's a stay at home mom and that sort of stuff. So they don't really have any hand in the business, and I I, you know, I venture to say probably not. Sh- not much knowledge of its inner workings. And, and the company itself was sold. I wasn't even aware of that. When did that happen? I mean, there's got to be a board, right? There's got to be decision. But, but you're, what you're saying is that basically Jonathan pulled the strings on that sale too. Yeah. Him and his partner, I believe. Yeah. Is it politically incorrect to mention that he had... Uh, Two partners. He had a business partner and, and a husband, husband. And a husband. No. So I was actually going to ask that question myself. SK Capital bought uh, bought them uh, September 29th. September 29th uh, of, of this year? Yeah. In 2019, the company was worth $3 billion. It's hmm. a good amount of money. So what you're saying is basically Jonathan kind of controlled the sisters in this sense, and he pushed for the sale of this company? I would imagine. I don't even know whether they cared them. So there's no, so Apotex exists still, but under new ownership. That's correct. Investigative uh, people like you, do they ever get. By the way, Carm, I was on the Fox 5 investigative unit. Yes, uh, yes, they do. Do they run into danger? Yes, yes. I mean, the head of the American Nazi Party, uh, with a, at one point years ago, with a Glock on his desk, uh, asked me if I was from the Jew York Post. So. Mm. And now, uh, the photographer with me was Jewish, so so uh, but, we make our excuses with and left. But, Brad strikes but me as a kind nervous. of Brad strikes me as a kind of guy that can handle his own. Carmen, when I was doing the all important JFK, st- I was doing a story at JFK Airport about these guys that were hustling. They were handling luggage. They were hustling tourists, and we exposed them. And one of the guys threatened to beat me up. You know what I did? I walked very quickly away from him. <laughs> but Brad can. Ha- <laughs> Brad, Brad could handle himself. So back to the sun here. So it is important for the purposes of this story and I guess other purposes. So Jonathan is openly gay. He marries a husband. He has a business partner who's not his husband. Brad's with the sun. Kevin's with a star. Okay. And, and Donovan won't speak to us. So Brad is our favorite. So whatever. But anyway, he told Donovan. Number two, but trying harder. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I'm not going to kill my dad because he needs $50 million to get through a crisis, Jonathan said over a five-hour chat with Donovan. And then he says to Donovan, most vexing to him is that his sister Alex, his own sister, thinks he was involved, which has now created a rift in the family. And then uh, Jonathan says to Donovan, I want to arm you with the truth. He says it was he who pushed for a private investigation team to get an independent pathologist to do a second set of autopsies. Um, If you're somewhat intelligent and you've committed a crime, you're going to set up decoys, right, Brad? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, You know, delay, obfuscate, delay, obfuscate. You know, so what's a decoy here? A decoy is that he 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 himself calls it. Yeah, he was giving a a, he he was giving a reward. He was saying that uh, he was pushing for an investigation team. If you're the one committing the crime, you're pushing for the investigation team. You're probably you you financially control and otherwise a second set of autopsies. You know, he didn't do it himself. There's no way he did it himself. Right, Brad? So he hired someone. So what the hell does he care about these autopsies now? Um, this was interesting, too, I thought. In this same interview, uh, Jonathan tells Donovan, had he been a quote-unquote straight boy, his relationship with his mother would have been perfect, just like you and me, Carm. His being gay was something that upset Honey in earlier days, but that she and Barry made his husband feel uh, welcome. Um, Jonathan has also referred to himself as the heir apparent to his father's fortune, 
which is today estimated to be worth somewhere between 5 and $10 billion. So, Brad, I assume that these are the reasons why you think it is likely Jonathan that's behind it. We're not saying that he is, but this is what some people are suspecting. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, people are are of that view. I mean, you know, he hasn't been charged or convicted of anything, nor have the police named him as a suspect. Just my amateur opinion is is a he might be one of the front runners, and apparently his sister thinks so too. And have you ever spoken to Jack Kay, the former president that was hired by Jonathan? And if so, did he have anything to say about who he thought might be behind this? I spoke briefly, briefly with him at Barry and Honey's funeral, which was, you know, sort of an early, very, very early going. I haven't spoken with him since. My colleague Joe Warmington has spoken with him, and I don't know whether he shed a whole lot on it. One of the things that could have been a bone of contention wherever it came from is that Barry was extraordinarily cheap. Uh, I mean, he would he would drive his cars until the wheels were falling off. Uh, I think one year for his birthday, Honey bought him a new red sports car, and he told her to take it back. And it was a Mustang. It wasn't like it was an Aston Martin. It was a Mustang. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does life make any sense at all? This guy's worth $10, $5, $10 billion. He won't buy a a new car, makes his wife return it, yet he's Well, you have an unnamed friend. Yeah, I appreciate if you didn't name him. I won't name him because I'm very discreet. Joel has a friend who is very comfortable and is cheap as hell. Yeah, well, it happens. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, I don't know. So there's another, there's one last person here, and then I want to kind of dive off in a couple things. I know you have a life and you probably want to get cracking, but let's, uh, so we talked about, uh, the original company, and I'm blanking on the name right now. What was it? Was uh, Empire Pharmaceuticals? That was the original Empire Laboratory. Yeah, labor. They say laboratories. Labor- we say All laboratories, right, right. but uh, same difference. Anyway, so the guy who owned that was a gentleman named Winter. Well, Winter had kids, and one of them was a guy named Kerry Winter, and he was interviewed on a show called The Fifth Estate, which is on the CBC. And uh, he basically came out and uh, failed a lie detector test after making unsubstantiated allegations that Barry Sherman had approached him, this guy Winter, to kill his wife two decades ago. So who is this uh, Kerry Winter guy and how does he factor into all this? Uh, Kerry, Kerry Winter is a troubled guy. He, uh, he was, as I mentioned earlier, his father was the founder of Empire uh, Labs. Also, that way, to save you guys from taunting me about how I say laboratories. But uh, and his father, uh, Louis Winter, and he was Barry Sherman's uncle. When the four Winter children were very young, their parents died within 17 days of one another. The company was left to Barry. And part of the deal was, again, that as long as he didn't sell it, each of the kids would get a 5% share in jobs working for Empire. Well, Barry sold it uh, on his cousins. And uh, so I guess Lewis Winter didn't think he'd sell it, but he did. And so his Barry's cousins were out of luck. And one of these people out of luck was Gary uh, Winter, who had you know, struggled with uh, you know, cocaine uh, addiction and you know, myriad other problems. And and and, so, and, uh, and he was also very angry at his... Uh, well, not just angry. So he told his psychiatrist, this is Kerry Winter, the son of the original owner of Empire Pharmaceuticals, which then became Apotex. He told his psychiatrist, and this is according to his own words on this uh, CBC show, I would talk about killing Barry, and it was very graphic, he would come out of the parking lot of Apotex and I'd be hiding behind a car and I'd just decapitate him. I wanted to roll his head down the parking lot and I'd sit there and wait for the police. This is the nephew. Is it nephew? It's a cousin. 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 First cousin. So, I mean, Brad, that's almost too obvious when you got a guy coming out and saying this. I mean, you don't think there's any chance Kerry was behind this killing? No, no, it was it was a you know a professional job. He wouldn't have he didn't have the skills to carry out a professional job. He didn't have the money to hire professionals. You could say he had motive, but which again gets to money, right? But 
but uh, but no, Carrie Carrie Winter is an also ran. What's the going market rate for a contract killer these days? Depends. <laughs> Depends who you want killed. I think. I mean, you know, uh, guns, some blow, and uh, a couple grand would do it with street games because often now that the you know the trad- traditional organized crime have like you know, other big corporations have offloaded their killing profitable arm of their business. So they've, uh, you know, offloaded murder to street gangs, basically, right? With not always satisfactory results, but, um, but, uh, you know, probably five to 10 grand. Seems pretty, pretty reasonable. That's very, it's a good buy. But it's, it's a very good buy, right? Yeah. And that's partly because of the low dollar here. Yeah. Um, you get a watch. My, for that, my que- question is also, I read somewhere or I imagine that I read that none of the cameras in the house were on. That's right. And, and you know, now I'm an expert on crime because I, I, of the Markel case. And I know that they, did, they found the murders w- with cameras on, on buses. In the Markel case. In yeah, the Markel they, they case. So to. now I'm thinking... What happened with all these cameras? In, in well, at least the cameras on the floor where the pool was were not were not on. Is that right? That's that's correct. But I mean, the thing is, if you're a professional, you know, I mean, and you're a team. And I, I think I think I, I, I'm fair in saying that the the standard that the belief is that there was a team of people. It wasn't just one lone killer. So, Brad, here's my question to you. How do you follow the story? Like, I mean, this one source tells you he doesn't think it's ever going to get solved. So what with as it relates to this story, what is your day to day like? How do you keep up with it? How do you try to move it forward? It's, it's kind of on the shelf. I've got my ear to the ground, but I don't I don't day to day. And I've got, you know, too many other things to do. And Kevin Donovan's paper has way more money than we do. So, so, you know, they can afford to let him do nothing, but unfortunately I have to write a column. I have to do this. I have to do that. So it's, it's a little different scenario. There's always something cooking. So we'd be remiss if we didn't talk to you for just a couple minutes about, uh, the Markel case. Are you following the Markel case still? I mean, are you still on it? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So, uh, first question, does Charlie get convicted? Do you think? (laughs) <laughs> I would say Charlie's done like dinner. I mean, uh, as the old commercial said, sorry, Charlie. You know? <laughs> yeah, Charlie's Charlie's done. What about, um, do you think Donna gets indicted and Harvey Adelson, do you think they get indicted? Uh, I mean, my view is, is, is that Harvey may be the one who wiggles out of it. Donna, I think absolutely. And you, you've been in touch with uh, Ruth, I understand. Yes, I have. You have a chance to read her book, The Unveiling. I haven't. I haven't read the book yet, uh, but you know because I covered the case, and you know she was happy because you know I mean I've been really the only person in Canada covering it, so so she's quite happy with that. And you know they live here, so yeah, I did. I had a very, a very, very, very nice, warm woman. So I guess the other question in Dan Markell case is Wendy. What do you yeah, got? That, that was my next question. Do you think she was the uh, mastermind of this, Brad? I don't think she was the mastermind, but I would say, how could she not know? <laughs> she, I think she was the manipulator, and she kind of put the ideas into the other people's. Really? Um, that's that's I- interesting, Carm. That's interesting. You know what? I'll buy that. I, I don't think you're wrong by a long shot. So, Brad, just to make sure I was clear, so you think that Harvey yeah, could, yeah, yeah. You, you think Harvey could wiggle out but you think that Donna will get charged with this crime yes, eventually? Yes, she said that. He said yeah, that. Yeah. He's a, she's a he. And uh, do you think Wendy ultimately gets uh, charged with this crime? She's been I named. Do. She's been named a co-conspirator. You, you said you do. I do. I do. Yeah. You've covered crime for a long time. It can't be a very good feeling knowing that you've committed a crime and police are are hunting you and looking at you and surveilling you. Like, what kind of life? Do you think Wendy and Donna are living right now? I, I, I don't know about Donna, but Wendy looks like she's living her best life. Whether that's a ruse, I don't know. I mean, people who are involved in, in that sort of thing also have a certain amount of hubris. 
uh, you know, woven into their character where they don't think they're going to get caught. Now, mind you, Charlie getting busted is no doubt a wake up call. And, you know, Charlie may uh, may uh, be forced to sing for his supper. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of I'm su- surprised this this hasn't been a death penalty case since in Florida, to be totally frank. Well, it's interesting. We happen to have Georgia Kaplman on the lead prosecutor and on our very humble little podcast, she broke news saying it would not be a death penalty case right on this podcast. But um, the reason being is that uh, Dan Markell himself, the, uh, the professor, the law professor, was very opposed to death penalty. So they never gave the death penalty to the actual guy who pulled the trigger. Right. And for that reason, they weren't going to give it. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Son. That makes sense. I, I mean, but, but technically, the, you know, it, it does strike me as a death penalty case. Uh, one last question for you. What's the craziest crime that you've ever covered, Brad? Oh, well, there's two. One's actually a crime. And the other one appeared to be a crime, but then became something else. Uh, the Now, this I, I just did a rewrite on this, but it was out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The cops go to this couple's house. The husband's dead with one between the eyes, and the wife's got a, a, a great bullet graze on the side of her head. And Guilty. so she, t- she, tells, she tells the cops that, you know, they were deep, and which is true, they were deep in debt for gambling and whatnot, and that they had, uh, you know, had signed, a, you know, we're going to do a murder suicide pact, and that, you know, she chickened out at the last minute. And so, okay, the cops buy the story. Now, the one thing is, is she wants to get rid of her late husband's African parrot. She hates the parrot, hates it, hates it, hates it, right? So, she gives the African parrot to the guy, dead guy's parents. Well, not a day is the bird in the house, and the bird starts going, "Don't fucking shoot! Don't fucking shoot!" <laughs> and the and, and, and the parents are saying, "What the hell is this? What the hell is this?" But the bird keeps going on, "Don't fucking shoot! Don't fucking shoot!" So finally, they call the cops. The cops reopen it, and, and the cops, you know, to their credit, to their open mindedness. Uh, you know, buy it and reopen it, and the woman's now doing 25 in uh, Michigan State Prison. So she <laughs> shot him, and, and the grew. parrot said, "Wow, wow!" He and the parrot was the repeating parrot what the husband was saying. Yeah, unbelievable. So that's no, the wild. Joel, Joel is a huge animal lover. Now he will want to get a parrot, an African parrot. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> What's the one that was a crime that wasn't a crime? That was when I was. Um, working at the New York Post. And uh, it wasn't my normal sort of thing. I was, you know, on, on the road a lot doing feature stories and covering national stories. And, uh, but it was, you know, dog days of summer. And there was suspicious death at a nice address on the Upper East Side. So they didn't, the, my desk didn't even think it was much. And they said, you know, just pop by, dot our I's, cross our T's on your way into the office, right? And by the time I got there, it had been ruled that it wasn't a suspicious death. But so I asked the doorman, because it's a nice building. You still want to know, right? So I uh, asked the doorman, you know, you know, who was this guy? What's the deal? And, you know, he told me the guy's name. It was uh, a man named Irwin Rose. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, and what was he like? And the doorman said, I don't know. He hasn't left his apartment in 15 years. So I said, well, what, what? What happened? Did somebody bring in his groceries and all that sort of stuff? And the uh, being the intrepid reporter, I, the the doorman said he ordered out. And I said, well, you know, where did he order out from? The doorman said, well, the diner down the street. And I said, oh, yeah, where else did he order from? No, just the diner down the street. <laughs> so I go down to the diner down the street. And so I asked, what did he order? And so they said, you know, sausages, eggs over easy, rice pudding, and a chocolate shake. And I said, oh, yeah, what, what else? What else did he? Uh, what else did he have? No, that's what he ordered three times a day for fifteen <laughs> years, right? So, of course, it turns out the the post 
comes out the next morning on the front page, mystery of sausage and eggs, Herman. So we followed this up and, you know, the next day I had Donald Trump on the phone yelling at me because this guy was a friend of his and, you know, I made him seem like a joke and, and, and Oleg Cassini called me. And, and we, so we started looking more and more into this guy and the only, you know, became friendly with people that knew him. There were people that described him as their best friend that had never laid eyes on him. There were other uh -huh. people that swore they had pictures of this guy and they couldn't find them. He, uh, he was a guy that would say, Joel, you should meet Carm. I think you two can do business. And then if anything comes of it, you kick him back some dough, right? And in the end, the only photo we could get of him uh, was I sat Shiva with his sister was from his uh, bar mitzvah in 1945. <laughs> are you sure That's he's actually, awesome. are you sure he died? Maybe he didn't die, this guy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like he didn't live, but uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's the Irwin Rose story. Wow. Did they ever tell you why he never left his apartment? I'm thinking of doing well, the same with my he was a medical, condition. medical condition. Interesting. Oh, it was the rice pudding that killed him. Brad, listen. Well, well, we sent that. We sent our restaurant reviewer to the diner and who said it was the best chocolate milkshake he'd ever had. But his lead was called the cardiologist. <laughs> Brad, listen, we cannot thank you enough. We were trying to get a hold of you. I'm so glad we did. Um, tell the audience again Anytime. the name of the paper that you work for and your books so we can plug you guys. Okay. I, I'll send you I'll send you a, uh, uh, a cover anyways of the book. But uh, I'm a national, Brad Hunter, national crime columnist for the Toronto Sun. And my most recent book is Inside the Mind of John Wayne Gacy, the Killer Clown. Not a place you want to be inside the mind of John <laughs> Wayne Casey. <laughs> oh, believe me, no. <laughs> Brad, thanks so much. We appreciate Thank it. You. We'll Thank get you back. Time. Yeah, we'll get yeah, you back on. It was the most when... enjoyable hour. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank I'm, you. It's been, it's been lovely to meet you, Carm. You too, Joel. Lovely to meet you, Carm. Love you to meet you. I have to translate Canadian to the Hungarian. No, I didn't. <laughs> Brad, awesome. We'll see you next time. We'll get a development. Love you, America. Yeah.